Hello, friends. We survived another work week. Welcome to Canifact Friday Live. Uh, this is episode three. We're so excited to have you. And if it's your first time joining us, Canifact Friday Live is a weekly show right here on LinkedIn Live where we share cannabis consumer data and then provide context about what it might mean. So today is a very special day. My name is Adriana Hemans. I am the VP of Strategy at ISA, which is an insights firm located in Los Angeles. We specialize in cannabis consumer research. I'm joined by my co-host, David Palaschuk, who is the best-selling author of the very first book about branding cannabis called Branding Bud, The Commercialization of Cannabis. Welcome, David. Hey, Adriana. How are you this morning? Doing great, thanks. Right on. Um, thank God it's kind of fact Friday, I should say, and, uh, I'm, I'm excited. We've got a great guest, uh, actually two guests, uh, which, uh, a little surprise guest as well. Um, so, uh, we'll introduce, uh, our guest, uh, Warren shortly and his compadre. Um, what's most important and, and just to fill folks in, uh, since we're still fairly new, this is our third episode of kind of fact Friday. What we do is, um, we, uh, look at um, data points and, uh, and trends in the industry on a weekly basis, and we pick out things that uh, catch our attention. And then we try to make sense of them. And we do that by contextualizing them in the world we live and in the business we work. And we bring in experts to come and help us make sense of it. So, um, so as we're making sense of things, we, we hope we're, we're adding value and, um, and giving you a place to, um, to ask questions as well, and to uh, to make sense of of our uh, nonstop, ever changing uh, industry that we work in. So, with that, um, the the one thing that's most important is please feel free to join in. Um, we have a chat, so if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask, and we'll get to them before uh, our event is over. It does go quick a lot of times. I, I know we did miss a question or two last week, so please forgive us up front if that happens, but we'll try to get your questions in. Um, so with that, um, let's kick it off, Adriana. Yeah, let's kick it off. Oh, and, and one more one more item. We were chatting backstage about possibly changing the music, the start music for next time. If you have any thoughts on some music you'd like to hear, drop us a chat or drop something in the chat or send us a message on, on LinkedIn and we'll we'll take a look at those suggestions. So yes, let's kick it off. This week's topic, we are diving into flavor preferences, which is super important. Flavor is really key when you're um, talking about any cannabis product, whether it's something that you chew, that you smoke, that you drink. Folks in the industry certainly have strong opinions about it but what do consumers really want? So we're gonna share with you some data from a survey. We polled 804 edibles consumers uh, to find out what flavor profiles they are interested in most, what they like, what really uh, gets them excited to tantalize their taste buds. So we can throw up that first, yes, thank you, the first slide. So overall, really, there's a strong preference for sweet flavors, for fruity flavors, I wanted to pull out a couple things that I said, hmm, this might be worth exploring a little bit more. I was surprised, I think, to see, first of all, that there was a preference for some traditional flavors. So a lot of our, our people that we talk to, our consumers who are from across the US, said that when it comes to edibles, they like a traditional flavor such as chocolate, strawberry, those, uh, those classics, right? Something that's familiar and accessible. Uh, and I think this sort of tells the story, right, of for people who maybe are new to trying an edible, it might, maybe it's your first time, or you're just sort of dipping your toe into the space and exploring it, that kind of makes sense, right? You might not want something where the novelty is the flavor, you are focused on the novelty of the experience. Maybe you're not exactly sure what this is going to be like, or uh, you may have heard a story that that it can be strong or you're just sort of experimenting. So maybe that first step is a traditional flavor. Then you start to branch out and try spicy things, exciting things um, down the road. So that was the first part. The other piece that I wanted to share today is something related to the plant taste. So we asked consumers how strongly they agree or disagree with the statement 
the less I can taste of the plant, the better. The plant being the, the cannabis plant. Um, and it turns out there's a small segment, 11%, that say, I want to taste the plant. I like that taste. I want to taste that in my edible. Um, and then 20% saying that they don't care if they can taste it or not. I thought that was interesting because I think I, I see this drive, and maybe you've seen the same thing, David, this drive toward covering up the plant taste or masking the plant taste. That's something that we see on packaging sometimes, sometimes things that, that edible brands, um, how they describe their product is that you don't taste the cannabis plant. And you know, if you were the, the owner of a brand or someone who is in product development, you wouldn't necessarily throw out your whole design idea just to appease that 11%. But I think it is interesting to kind of look at, uh, at that segment and, and, and see how it's, it's maybe not what you might expect. Um, and I, I think, and I'm curious to know if you agree with me on this one or not. I don't like to make a lot of comparisons with alcohol and cannabis because, of course, they're very different. But it sort of reminds me of how you develop a taste for, for alcohol. Like if you are just starting out drinking, you may be drawn to sugary drinks where you can't taste the alcohol. And then as your palate matures, uh, you might be drawn to a more adult style flavor where you can actually taste some of those um, natural flavors. What do you think about that? Yeah, <clears throat> I, I agree with what, with what you're saying. I, I think for me, there's sort of three three metrics here almost. Um, there, there's technology, there's preferences, and there's expectations. And, and let me start off briefly with technology. Over the course of the last few years, um, technology relative to homogenizing cannabinoids within an edible or a beverage has really taken off. So, you know, maybe five years ago, you would still be purchasing beverages um, where the cannabinoids and the oils were separating over time. So you'd go in and you'd purchase something, and you know you could see the oil slick at the at the top of of the you know the bottle, so to speak, um, or when you opened it on on the cap. So that also made for a very strong taste or 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 a distasteful. Um, non-pleasing experience right so i think in the last few years um with companies uh like source like vertosa um and, and a number of others uh the technology has really gotten to a place where um we, we can really homogenize cannabinoids within um so I, I think that's one the other thing is um really um expectations so if you look at a brownie for a moment and you eat a brownie, your, even though it's a cannabis infused brownie, your expectations are, I'm eating a brownie. So you're still looking for that rich, dense, chocolatey taste. And, and if it varies from your experience with brownies in the past or your favorite brownies, then, you know, now you're, you're messing with your expectations. Whereas in beverage, I think there's so many different types of beverages so many different um, consistencies of beverages from you know a yogurt to a, a, a yogurt lassi to a milk all the way through to a sparkling champagne um, they're just so different so i think there's more room for um for play if you will within the beverage category but i think at the end of the day cannabis consumers or consumers are still looking for something similar but different and and so I, I think, you know, th they want to ground themselves maybe in something they know, like a cherry flavor or something that's familiar. But it's that experience and that journey they'll take, you know, um, that they may that they might <clears throat> explore with. So it's interesting to see how all these different things come into play. Um, yeah, this is expectations and technology. Absolutely. And I do want to share, we do have a comment here in the chat from Dustin Hawksworth, who said, I tend to not want to taste the plant as it reminds me of my college days when I ate way too much and ended tripping, throwing up, etc. I don't mind a little bit of the plant flavor, but would prefer not to taste it. David, your brownie analogy is spot on. Thanks, Dustin. I think we can all relate to that uh, experience at one point or another in our lives. 
Thank you, Justin. I'm glad you're with us today. Thanks for joining us. Um, but uh, again, um, it's just interesting to sort of see uh, how we've been accustomed to other products and how those products, you know, and those experience inform new products that we try within uh, cannabis infused products. Right. It's always that tension between the novelty and the familiar, right? That's right. That's right. Um, well, so, so that said, um, we have so much more to talk about, but uh, what I would love to do is, uh, is bring out our guest and his guest. Um, and, and so that sort of kicks off into uh, a formal introduction here. And um, Warren Bobro is, is not only a friend, but uh, an industry influencer. He's been around uh, forever. And um, uh, I always joke with him because he uses this term more than I do, uh, but I call him a class act and I'm excited to bring him out. He is, um, uh, God, he is a six time author of uh, a number of um, books on mixology, uh, both um, alcohol only and alcohol and cannabis. Um, he has uh, written, here he is. Um, he has, Welcome he's written Warren. Books. Thank you. Hey Warren. Hey, David. Uh, and we are, yes, and this is Klaus. Yeah, he does, he's very shy. He doesn't speak much, but it's that little red head. So we'll just leave it at that. He's the strong silent type. Well, the, the hollow silent type. <laughs> <laughs> he's made of terracotta. And uh, so he's very fragile, as I learned in Berlin. Yes. Anyway. Um, I I feared I almost come close to knocking Klaus over uh, at the bar that you were at at the Hall of Flowers party, and uh, right. I was very careful around Klaus. So Klaus, yeah. please, please forgive me. And then, He's a of fragile course, this gentleman. Is the, uh, this is the book that started it all. But I wrote it in 2014, 2015. Um, crazy what the way it changed my life, and uh, it changed the industry around me, and it led to uh, to this named for him <laughs> there you have it it's as simple as that when you do what you love and you're passionate about it and you do everything that you possibly can in life to be a success but they all fail something has to give somewhere and this is what happened to me I'm i love how you're embracing animal. whimsy with your brand warren thank you we're very lucky i, I have a wonderful team and uh we're all kind of misfits in our own way, and but we understand things very clearly because we have vast backgrounds in, in television and filmmaking and advertising and manufacturing. And, uh, you know, I started as a dishwasher, so what do I know? And then I worked in a bank for 20 years. So, <laughs> so you know a lot. Sure. I, right. I, well, I, I know a lot about nothing, and I think that's the key to kind of separate yourself from what you know to what you truly, what you don't know, and you need to experience at some point in your life, and it took me 60 years, but uh, I don't think I know anything other than how to put a successful product out onto the market and change the world, because it's not another one of those trendy seltzers that uh, clog the marketplace. I'm a you know, trained mixologist. I want to create something that challenges your intellect. It also makes you, you smile and you say, oh, it's not seltzer. What is it? Well, it's a ready to drink drink made with three ingredients. And that's, that's it. And, that, and it goes back to when I worked as a bartender and you would have 20 people walk up in front of you and you spent the whole day challenging yourself to create all these really creative cocktails and mocktails that would just blow them away. And everyone has something different in five of them. Mm -hmm. And so Warren, this is a perfect segue since we're talking about flavors. And when you developed this, you set out to make a not sweet drink. Exactly. Can you tell us about that that journey and and why embrace the the non sweet flavor profile. Well, it's like life itself. It's a combination of bitter and sweet. <laughs> um, I you know being Jewish, I'm blessed somehow with a Jewish gut, so I look to beverages that that kind of calm my my digestion and klaus is just that i mean it has a touch of rice vinegar in it so it acts to soothe your gut uh, not only is vinegar used in drinks like vermouth 
but it's also in it, it's in many many different applications in the culinary kitchen but it's used to soothe your gut and if you have a stomach ache it's something that works very nicely and if you don't it's something that also you know makes you thirsty it makes you hungry it's settles your gut it's just a, an easy thing to drink but you really don't detect it in the drink it's just slightly tangy but for me to tell you what it is and tell you that that it really brings out the other two ingredients which are Pickett's ginger syrup. I use the extra hot and spicy ginger syrup from my friend Matt Pickett in Denver, Colorado. We have a relationship going back for years, working with these high, high end bartending ingredients. I'm not industrialized. I created a drink purely out of passion using ingredients that you can buy for like a, in a, like a bakery or a bartending supply or anything, you know, a food service company even sells it. My, uh, my, Puree comes from France. It's something that comes frozen. It's from Les Vergeres Boron. I've been working with them for, you know, at Tales of the Cocktail down in New Orleans for years. But when I make cocktails for people, I want to use the very best. And it kept in my mind, what could I possibly use to make a drink that was different than everything else on the market? It's not industrialized. It's made with great ingredients. It tastes good. And it has weed in it. But not just weed. I worked with Vertoza. I created something with them that's a single strain. It's a craft strain. We use the uh, the strain called Hippie Crasher. So it tastes slightly like it. It smells slightly like it. And it works really beautifully with that slightly, slight, you know, spicy ginger at the end of the day. It's slightly spicy in the drink with that lime puree. It's fresh. It's refreshing. And it's like nothing else that's on the market. I'm lucky. You know, I have a talent for this. And, this, and is what, this is what did it. And you do, Warren. But let me talk about that. Because if someone's not a foodie or a mixologist, um, and they're hearing this for the first time, um, I think I think they'd have an interesting, you know, sort of interesting time putting that together. So I've tried Klaus uh, at the Hall of Flowers event with you. Um, I thought it was one of the most interesting flavor profiles I had ever tasted, tasted period, in a beverage. Um, if you had told me, <clears throat> like, like you've described it, there's vinegar, there's ginger, and there's lime, um, I probably would not necessarily find that maybe all that appealing, uh, hearing it, but tasting it, it was something different. And it activated different parts in my mouth it was it was a very exciting beverage to drink and and so um, I applaud you for creating something which is absolutely not only unique in the cannabis space but also unique as a beverage uh, just period hands down as a flavor it's it's really beautiful and unique yeah you know it's funny that you say that for years I, as I said for 10 years I attended tales of the cocktail and always did the opening day punch up at the top of you know, the roof deck pool at the top of the Hotel Monteleone, which is a, an experience all of its own. And every year since the very first time that I did it, people would come to me and they say, you know, who are you? This is the best drink I've ever had. And I would say, you know, I'm Warren Bobro. I'm a, you know, I'm a bar back. <laughs> I'm learning how to become a bartender. I happen to have this talent in making drinks and uh, people like what I do. Uh, I got the attention of uh, Sands Lane and they nurtured me and they didn't do anything for me and they didn't hold my hand, but they helped me figure out what I needed to do to become who I am in the uh, cannabis beverage business. And as I said, you know, I'm not making a, another one of those trendy seltzers that just doesn't interest me. My USBG friends would kill me. You know, they would say, like, didn't we teach you anything about mixing drinks? And here you are making seltzer and it doesn't have CBD in it. And it's like, no, there's no CBD in it. It's, you know, it's 10 milligrams of uh, THC and it's the good stuff. And it's a single strain. And it's craft. And you know, we're only making 5,000 cans. You know, what else can I tell you? It's, it's, it's the, like the luckiest thing I've ever done. But, uh, but it also has a lot of basis behind it. And that's what, what makes it authentic. Yeah. I, I'm really curious, Warren. You know, you see here on the screen, we have a slide up about 
how um, different age groups right. age group view what uh, what the flavors are, what they are looking for in their edible. So I'm just curious, you went on this journey, you developed this flavor profile, you yeah. clearly have spent a lot of time, you know, to understand what people like and what they don't like and how to create these like taste experiences. Uh, what, uh, what did you look at? Like what no, did you I, I, sort of draw no, from? I, I didn't draw from, from any of this, these metrics. I drew from my own experience and I don't make mm -hmm. sweet drinks period. So I don't care what anyone else is drinking. I know what they're drinking and I, and what they're drinking sucks and it's not good for them. And drinking is poison, and the sooner they get away from it, the better. And you know, it's big business. The alcohol is the license to print money. So does cannabis, but you have to handle it in the right way. And I wanted to create Klaus not because it's a cannabis beverage, but it's a beverage that has cannabis as part of its of its rule because it's non antagonistic. That's what it is. It's not that it's I'm drinking a weed beverage. It's I'm drinking a beverage because I want to be around people who are drinking alcohol and be accepted by them. I don't care that it's a that it's a cannabis beverage. What I care about is it takes away the stigmas of having a cannabis beverage in the first place. And I wanna be able to enjoy a beverage in a social setting without anyone knowing my business. When I come there and I smoke a joint, everyone knows that I'm a stoner immediately. Well, they probably know anyway. But the point is, is that they don't need to know what's in my glass. And that is the ultimate stigma here. It's that you were treated differently because we smoke a joint than we do with someone who's drinking a martini. But if I want to go to a cocktail party and drink this, no one has to know what that is. They, they have no idea what that is, but it's really cool and it's intriguing and what's in it is delicious. And yeah, what else do I know? <laughs> well, I think Klaus has uh, <clears throat> made the transition pretty easily from uh, the alcohol, yeah. alcohol side. To yeah, he's, he's got a little, you know, a little thing on his chest there, a little, little uh, tankard. I don't know. What's oh, is in that it. a bottle he's holding? Media. Yeah, it's a it's a bottle. Isn't that cool? Warren, I have to ask this. Um, you must have a Halliburton um, briefcase uh, or something. I do. <laughs> I do. I do, actually. And I've got to start traveling with it. I've got this. There you go. Okay. <laughs> it's, and it's got my Dro sticker on it. So, you know, it's like, yeah, and it's really cool because he fits right in it. It's got a little compartment. For, for he's traveling VIP all the way. He is. Oh my God, he's famous. You've got to protect him. <laughs> <laughs> it's got the uh, the egg crate and everything. That's perfect. That's exactly what I. Yeah, it's serious. This is like for, for photographic equipment. <laughs> I thought it might have been aluminum though, but uh... Uh, I would like one of those. Those are really expensive. I have to make a dime before I can pay a hundred. You know, a couple thousand. <laughs> I'd really, you know, my dream in life is to be self-sufficient. I've been on my own since 18. So, you know, it hasn't always been easy. Um, this gives me a, ch excuse me, it's a very, you know, very emotional thing because it's, uh, it gives me a chance to be the Warren I've always wanted to be in an eight ounce container. I mean, just like that. As simple as that is. That's, that's the meaning of life for me. That's Warren, that's such a great tagline for you. The Warren I've always wanted to be in an eight ounce container. I love it. <laughs> that should be your first tattoo. Oh, I have four of them. Oh. <laughs> they're, they're, right. they're, they're all Klaus related, right? <laughs> no, they're not. No, it, this is, you know, I, I, I'd show you my employees. I'd show you my employees only one that got me into trouble in Moscow. You know, that kind of thing. It's up here. No, there it is. Very nice. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's it's something that that only drinkers would understand. Real drinkers would understand. Day drinkers. <laughs> yes. Well, <clears throat> I'm not one of them. I'm I'm more of a night sweats guy. So um, <laughs> so, so that said, um, yeah. I know we have a, a few more questions, and we wanted okay. to, we just wanted to sort of touch upon. It's interesting because I think. I don't say that, but... um, you know, without using metrics, so to speak, you have serendipitously stumbled upon, um, y y you know, a different product in the market. And, and it's interesting. Oh, yeah. 
Um, well, because I, I, David, I know what's going on out there because I speak at the Cannabis Drinks Expo and I see whatever what everyone else is doing. And the first time I got up on stage, they were looking for me to say, all of you are doing an amazing job. The world is, is a beautiful place. There's no war. Everything is perfect. I got up on stage and I said, cannabis drinks suck because they do. They suck. They're, they're, I mean, they're, they're not testing their boundaries. They're not made by mixologists. They're made by marketers. They're made by people, the same people that put the worm in the mezcal. Certainly the <laughs> worm was living on the mezcal, but no one ever ate the freaking thing. You know, and they created this mystique of eating the worm. No one ate the worm. But this is the same thing as cannabis. You can create the story that you want to create. There are no rules. When I worked in the rum business all those years for, for the Russians, I mean, you know, it, the idea was to sell the very best that has the least done to it. Authenticity, good ingredients, simply prepared with love. That's all I'm asking. I'm not asking for a 14 ingredient dream. I'm not asking for industrialized ingredients. I'm looking for simplicity. If you can't do that, that's fine. But cannabis drinks suck because of that. And so, so let's just riff on that for a moment. So how, how does, so we're talking small batch. We're right, talking, small batch. How like does, craft, craft, the, you know, there's craft beer. Right. There's certainly craft beer everywhere. We drink craft IPAs. We love those Pacific Northwest IPAs from where you live. I mean, that's that's a style. Why can't what I do be a style? You know, my book is the first book on the topic like yours. Well, you know? well I think you need to find the people that have the technology that are licensed in multiple right. states. Well, that's what we're doing. That's, right. that's, 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 and that's the idea. And the idea isn't necessarily for me to be setting up manufacturing facilities. I would love to be in the place where I could license Klaus right. to to be able to, and then to be able to continue to be the face for the brand because, you know, he likes to travel. He's a traveling gnome. He's been all over the world with me and he has a lot of people yet to be, yet to meet. So. In, indeed he does. Would you, um, would you, should we bring up the, the, the flavor profiles again? Cause we didn't. Yeah, really please do. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Let's bring yeah. it, let's bring it up. And we're, we're curious, Warren, I mean, to get your take, quickly on, on how, how you see these. So basically, you know, we, we, Adriana, do you want to walk, walk through this and just sort of call out what, what, uh, you know, favorite edible flavors there are and profiles and what people are starting to, to look for? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this one, um, if, reading this, the one on the far right is the total, right? So that's the, the, the aggregate. But then we also broke it down by age groups because we wanted to see if there was a difference. Um, and there is. So, you know, as I mentioned before, the sweet ones are really the top pick across the board. But then if you look at things like spicy, we see folks in the in the 35 to 54 age range that are that are more interested in a spicy flavor. Um, I think and, and this really fits in with what you were saying, Warren, there's sort of I think people are wanting to try something different potentially, or they are, are driven for that novelty. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's something mm -hmm. where, you know, maybe, maybe there's an opportunity to figure out if what's a new, what's my new favorite, right? You're in a new category, mm -hmm. a new type of product. This is going to be something that may become part of your, of your ritual, but, but let's uh, be the best worn we can be or be the best, uh, edible consumer we can be. I, I, I just, I love how people's palates evolve over time and being not just born, I hate saying I'm 55 and above, but my flavor profile is definitely 55 and above. I mean, it, it just, it speaks to, uh, to where I am in the universe right now. Um, I, I've always made drinks that are geared towards 55 and above. And I think that's an important dialogue within this conversation because not every drink is going to be aimed at 55 and above. Most of them are aimed at that sweet spot between 21 and 45 because mm -hmm. they're still, they're still, they tend to be too sweet for me, but I know from working as a, as a bartender, people like sweet drinks. And I know from being, from being a bartender in Moscow and Russia, 
they came to me every single time when I made drinks. They say, it's not sweet. Why isn't it sweet? Because they love sweet drinks there. They they go crazy. I mean, grown men are drinking like uh, espresso martinis. I mean, that's like kids drink. Can I ask a totally off topic question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it true that in Russia they will chase a vodka shot with pickle juice? Uh, no, it's absolutely a lie. In fact, um, no one drinks vodka in the bars. The v vodka is drunk at home like schnapps. It's a it's a congenial drink. It's a drink to greet your friends with. You you make your vodka at home out of the fermenting masses out in the barn. I mean, it's nothing exotic or, or luxurious. It's it's schnapps. I mean, vodka is an invention for the United States, strictly. They love brown spirits. There is more bourbon in Moscow than anything you can imagine. We talk about a bourbon shortage in the United States. That, if you want to stop drinking, if you want to stop commerce, stop bourbon. Bourbon will be dead in the United States. It'll be dead in Russia because they, they go gaga over brown spirits because no one can afford them. They can't have them in their houses. A, a bottle of Pappy Van Winkle there is like tens of thousands of dollars for a man like myself to go to Russia and buy a bottle of Pappy. It was 10 bucks. It was nothing. It costs, it's zero. But if you're a Russian, you can't, you know, you can't afford luxury goods. It's out of your reach. So that's why people spend so much time in, in cocktail bars because it's all subsidized and they love brown spirits, scotch and bourbon. It's just, and, and the drinks have to be sweet, sweet, sweet. And, and the most popular uh, coffee in the, uh, in the, in the town is uh, Dunkin' Donuts and they like it light and sweet. And that's like, I, it just blew my mind. It's not Starbucks and you expect Starbucks is everywhere in, in, in the world and you expect it to be bitter, bitter, bitter. No, it's sweet, sweet, sweet. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I, I think now we we might have a way to uh, prevent uh, Russia from invading uh, the Ukraine because yeah, but it would kill it would kill our our uh, our whiskey business in the United States, and I that's, don't think anyone's willing to do that. That's because that's, if you cut off trade of whiskey to the east, to the east, you cut off the entire South. Yeah, any or any place that's making whiskey and exporting to 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 Russia. It's, it's wild. I hate working. I hated working in liquor. You get to know too much. And then then the whole thing of working in cannabis, at least it's localized for me. I mean, my company's in California and I can spend my time. It's a big state. You know, years ago, I worked for Maine Public Broadcasting and I got to see Maine like a local. I mean, now I get a chance to see California like a local. That's a real that's a gift for someone who's driven by their belly. I mean, that's like I, I get to eat Vietnamese everywhere. So Warren, talk to me a moment about, <clears throat> I think often of nostalgia um, mm. and, and how as we get older, you know, relative to flavor profiles, we're always sort of, you know, hearkening back to, um, to something that just, you know, reminds us of our, of our yeah. youth. Is, is yeah. there any, any, you know, sort of psychology, if you will, to develop oh, flavor profiles? Oh, no, I, I love what, I love that question because I'm struggling with it right now on my in my development of the next two skews and I'm doing a zombie and anyone who knows about uh, beach bum berries, uh, zombie punches, they're, they're memorable, but my zombie is, uh, it doesn't have any alcohol in it. it. It will have an appropriate type of THC in it, but see the struggle right now is a zombie is on the sweet side. So I want to make it so it has a, uh, I don't know. I'm toying around with lemongrass. I'm toying around with, uh, with cardamom, I'm toying around with with all these different flavors. The trouble is, they're not in the the place where I have to have it to create a beverage. So, it, it I know they're out there and I know they exist. But it, what I'm trying to do is create a, a beverage which is identifiable to an audience, but twist it in a different way. And this different way is the fact that it will have a strain of cannabis built into it that complements the other fine ingredients involved in the uh, in the zombie and and it'll become unique and memorable in its own sense and that's uh but it has to have a touch of sweetness so i'm working on whether i want to do a, a infused uh, agave syrup perhaps or maybe a raw honey or even a cane syrup that's uh thc infused and that's where vertoza or you know, you know someone like vertoza comes in because they work with terpenes and they they you know, fine tune the cannabis to the flavor that I'm looking for. 
that's exemplary of the strain that we chose. So it becomes very precise. It's really exciting. It's really cool. You know, it's it's funny. I have a friend, uh, Marco Hoffman, who is, uh, he founded Venice Cookie Company in California and then Evergreen Herbal up in Washington. But one of the interesting things that he always has interesting things to say, but one of the most interesting things that, that really caught my attention almost two years ago, he said is the entourage effect isn't only about cannabis. The entourage right. effect is about other things combined with cannabis, right? You know, and that that spectrum, if you will, extends. So it's interesting to hear you talk about how you're not only using different components, but also very in tune with cannabis and then the various components of cannabis, the terps and all the other things in order to make this, um, you know, orchestra of, of flavors and tastes that, that actually yes. well, speak or sing to you. And, and I think that it goes back to when I trained to be a saucier and, you know, I've been through culinary school, the American Culinary Federation uh, apprenticeship program. And that was because, you know, I, initially I set out to set out to work in television and it just didn't work out. And I wanted to work in film and it, 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 it didn't work out. So I had to figure out where my life was going. And I, I got a job as a, like a pot scrubber and dishwasher. I found myself living in Maine and I didn't have any money and it was winter time and you had to do something and I didn't want to starve. And I got a job, you know, working in a restaurant and it opened up a, a whole lifetime of, of experience to me. And, and I guess the, the point is that when you, when you work with, with people who are trained, you know, classically trained sauciers from France, you learn how to do things the, the way that, that you're supposed to do. It's not like opening up a Maggie, you know, cube and throwing it in and saying it's stock, it's roasting bones. It's, you know, it's the entire culinary experience. And not all of it is pleasant. When I worked in France, it was very unpleasant. You know, where's the American as the knife goes by the head or a pot or something. It's very, very detrimental to your health, but it taught me how to cook and cook for my heart. And that's why when I work with bartending ingredients, I want to create something that's, uh, that you know, it had it has some authenticity to it. So I guess what was the, what was the question? I went down a uh, a tangent. And I apologize. <laughs> so this is the energy. Stutter. Tangents are totally allowed and yeah, and I know. But, but it's from being stoned too early in the morning. <laughs> and, yeah, we're glad you survived that kitchen early kitchen experience. I yeah, think we have about four important. minutes left. Is there any um, any last sort of parting thoughts uh, you want to share with? Share with us yeah, well, you know, I, I, I want to share about in your own personal life, try not to drink quite so sweetly uh, or, you know, cut out sugar and alcohol as much as you can. I still drink red wine and, and white wine. I love it, but I don't drink any distilled spirits anymore. And, you know, I'm, as I said, I'm like 85 pounds lighter. I, I don't see it, but I, I know that I that the clothes that I used to wear are like gigantic now. Um, and it's, and it's so funny when you look at cannabis as more than a metaphor, I mean, I'm, this is 16 calories and less than a sixth of a gram of sugar and look at what other cannabis beverages are out there. And you'll be, I don't want to say you're going to be horrified, but I think you're going to be enlightened at what's in there and what's not. And I wanted to make it as healthful as possible. I come from a long line of, of, uh, people who are involved in, uh, you know, patent pharmaceuticals. My grandfather made Geritol. I mean, that was snake oil, if anything. Uh, he hated the fact that I used cannabis. So, uh, you know, I was on my own when he passed away. And it was a, uh, it was a rude awakening. But I think the, uh, the, at the end of the day, what it is, is when you have something, a talent or something you love, and you're passionate about it, and you try to take money out of the equation, at least as long as you can, uh, it'll be what will make you a great success. And that's, uh, you know, I'm not a great success yet, but hopefully someday. So. Well, well, I think you are a success. I think uh, anyone that, um, you, you know, has so much passion and can follow it and can manifest their dreams is successful. So I think you, you're, you're very successful. Um, I, I also think it's, you know, it's, it's wonderful um, how you've gone about it. And, and I think, um, I, I think it's probably true that uh, per per fluid ounce, uh, Klaus has more passion in it than any other uh, beverage on the market. What do you think? Uh, hey, I'm just a great throwing picture. up a slide here of that, the of the packaging because it is 
fun, whimsical. We need some bright colors to energize us as we close out our week. <laughs> I'm totally energized after hearing Warren speak for, for the last few minutes. So uh, Thank you. I'm, I'm very, very energized. Um, and then at the end, we'll throw up, we have a slide at the end, which has uh, the site if you want to go check out more of these products. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, so I'm I'm in a, coming to Soulful in Sevastopol by the end of the month, hopefully. Um, Tori Holistics in San Diego and currently at Vault, the Vault in a Cathedral City. They have a, a consumption lounge. So you can go there and hang out and meet your friends who are getting stoned on flour with one of your Klaus. Uh, it's pretty amazing. What, what, what an environment where you can crack open a can of cannabis infused beverage and be inside. It's I love it. Really cool. Absolutely. Well, um, you know, just to, to close out the show, um, um, I just want to thank everybody uh, for joining us, and I want to thank Warren and Klaus for joining us, and uh, and also Dustin for um, for for joining and asking questions and participating. Um, we always love questions, and we invite them. Um, we will be back as as we're doing every uh, every Friday at 10 a.m. PST and 1 p.m. Uh, EST on LinkedIn Live, where we'll be basically taking a data point, talking through it, contextualizing it, and um, speaking with industry experts to uh, get their take on things and uh, and help us all better understand what's going on in the market. So, um, so that said, you can find all of our information um, just just on the screen right now. Uh, information on Klaus at drinkklaus.com, um, ISA Corp which does research based in LA um, and uh, my book and my company, brandingbud.com. We're pretty excited. We've got a great show next week. Adriana, do you want to talk about next week for a moment? Yeah, next week we're talking to Claudio Miranda, who is from Guild Extracts, which is a concentrates and vape brand. So we're going to be talking about concentrates, taking a departure from, from beverages and edibles for a minute and exploring some other form factors. So that'll be uh, definitely a, a fun time. So meet us here next Friday. Yeah, Friday, Friday, Canifact Fridays. Um, thank you again, Warren. Um, we appreciate your time. We appreciate your insight. And, and that's his book. I've got one of them right behind me too on that stack of books right, right there. <laughs> that's right, thank you. You know. I think we're on the ninth printing, which is amazing. Absolutely. It's great. Well, thank yes. you everybody again. Thank you, Adriana. Thank you, Warren. Uh, we look forward to touching everybody next Friday. Um, and we promise we'll have more uplifting music and less English, <laughs> uh, if that's a word, omen, yeah. omen music uh, when, we, when we come in. So until next week, have a great weekend, a great week, and we'll see you next Anifact Friday. Thanks, everybody. Bye.